Thank you, Martin. Hard to live up to, to that, but um, I will do what I can. And I'm only too conscious that you are listening to me speaking a language that may not be your first language. And I'm really very conscious of the, my inadequacy in not being able to address you in German. If I were to try, you would flee the room. Um, so thank you for your patience in allowing me to speak in English. I also want to thank Martin van Gelder and, and his colleagues for this invitation. And an invitation not just to come to give this one talk, but to come for 10 days and have a sort of an immersion in the, the life of the Lichtenberg Kolleg. And it's, it's a, it, that's a great privilege and I'm enjoying it enormously. So many thanks, Martin. Thank you, uh, Dominic, uh, and Marie Louisa, and, and uh, everyone else who's made this all possible. So I'm going to talk this evening not about Vermeer. Vermeer will not get mentioned again, um, but about art and science in 19th century New England. So in 19th century Europe and its diaspora, which includes North America. The boundary between art and science was not so impermeable as it was later to become. Just as works could be classified by medium and place of origin, rather like natural history specimens, so dealers and collectors displayed and illustrated natural history specimens as bearers of aesthetic qualities. Now, new institutions of a type first founded in the mid-18th century absorbed all kinds of tangible things, artworks and natural history specimens, among others. And that this is what happened in Göttingen as well, with its own university museum. So these novel institutions, museums, were among the major generators of knowledge claims in the 19th century European world. They only ceded their authority, their scholarly authority, in many areas to even more novel institutions, research universities, in the early 20th century. So I'm going to try to relate what happened in, uh, in 19th century New England to some German, uh, uh, German origins, if you like including the idealism as a philosophical movement. So idealism as a, as a philosophical movement had a huge and generally unacknowledged impact on the formation, the fundamental principles, and the scholarly practices of museums. And this came about through the education of their founders, their directors, and their curators. However, it would be misleading to generalize further about this com complex phenomenon, it varied considerably from place to place and field of inquiry to field of inquiry. So I'm therefore chosen to present a pair of interlocking case studies that concern just one regional center of scholarship in mid 19th century European diasporic, di diasporic world, Boston, Cambridge, and Concord in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And here you can see, this is Massachusetts Bay. Here's the city of Boston, city of Cambridge, right next to it across the Charles River. And about 20 miles to the Northwest is the town of Concord. In the time that we're talking about that I'll be discussing, there were what was then known as the cars connecting Concord and Boston. That is the railroad. Now, museum formation, uh, let me, sorry, let me show you a little bit larger scale map. Museum formation, equally complex and ambitious, was occurring simultaneously in other centers of scholarship in the North American Northeast literal. For instance, in Boston's intellectual peer and competitor city, Philadelphia, and I'm sure you all know, here is, if I can get this, this is, Massachusetts, Boston is about here, down the coast you come to New York here, and then Philadelphia 
is down here, about, <laughs> about 400 miles away. Yet although idealism had an impact on Philadelphia's emerging collecting institutions, there are profound differences between the developments in these two places, in Boston and Philadelphia. In this exploration, I'm going to look at aspects of the work of two thinkers who knew one another, but who, to my knowledge, have never previously been paired or compared, Henry David Thoreau and Louis Agassiz. While Agassiz's founding of the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, at Harvard University in 1859, is well known, the fact that Thoreau formed a major collection, not only of natural history specimens, but of ancient North American Indian artifacts, is not so well known. Some 700 of Thoreau's Indian items have been in Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology since it opened in 1869. So even if not in the same museum, Agassiz and Thoreau's things are in the same building. These two museums, the Peabody and the Museum of Comparative Zoology, are in the same building. These are two ends of the same building. By 1869, tangible things had come to form the basis of an epistemology, a system of knowledge claims that gave rise to museums. And this was based on the premise that one could make knowledge claims derived from observation that leads to the distinction of particular characteristics. And that allows classification within a schema representing some truth about the world. Now, this was no easy task, as those who undertook it made clear. For instance, the prominent philosopher and poet from Concord, Massachusetts, Ralph Waldo Emerson, indicated the challenge in his essay, Experience, published in 1844. He wrote, and I quote, I take this evanescence and lubricity of all objects, which lets them slip through our fingers when, we, when then we clutch hardest, to be the most unhandsome part of our condition. Nature does not like to be observed, and likes that we should be her fools and playmates. Now, I want to look at aspects of the process whereby Thoreau and Agassiz and the collecting institutions they supported attempted to find form and order, as Emerson put it, in the world. Throughout the 19th century, American society experienced an increasing concern with the ordering and reordering of tangible things so that they should no longer appear what Emerson called a dull miscellany and lumber room, but offer meanings, whether in and of themselves or in consequence of their place in an orderly scheme. Museums were the principal institutional means of addressing this project. They did so in the first instance by means of classification, the discernment of similarities and differences among the sensually apprehensible properties exhibited by those tangible things. The Smithsonian Institution, founded in 1836 in Washington, D.C., became the largest single body in America devoted to this project. The Smithsonian was itself divided into a number of specialized units. And although these have changed, it remains, that's remained so. The classificatory habit of mind became so ingrained that its adherents used it to order the institutions of classification themselves, no less than the material subject classification within them. So in 1895, the Assistant Secretary of the Smithsonian in charge of the United States National Museum, George Brown Good, described six categories of museum in his book, Principles of Museum Administration. And you can see them on the screen, but I'm going to read these. They are as follows. A, museums of art. B, historical museums. C, anthropological museums. D, natural history museums. E, technological museums, and F, commercial museums. Now, with the exception of this last category, commercial museums, this schema is still the way in which museums are divided up. 
Now, Good's second axis of categorization concerns the character of museums by type rather than by field of inquiry. So we have G, national museums, H, local, provincial, or city museums, I, college and school museums, J, professional or class museums, and K, museums or cabinets for special research owned by societies or individuals. Thus, Good classified the classifiers. I'm going to focus on Good's categories C, D, and I, that is on anthropology museums, natural history museums, and college and school museums, specifically at Harvard University, with a mention of K, uh, particular cabinets for special research owned by individuals, specifically those of Agassiz and Thoreau. The Swiss natural historian Louis Agassiz arrived in Boston from Neuchâtel in the fall of 1846. He'd been invited to lecture by the Lowell Institute and would soon be appointed to head the new Lawrence Scientific School at Harvard. He began teaching there in the spring of 1848. By the time of his arrival in America, Agassiz had achieved renown in two areas, paleoichthyology, it's a wonderful word, and glaciology. His monumental five-volume Recherche sur les poissons fossiles had been published between 1833 and 1843, and his Etude sur les glaciers in 1840. However, Agassiz is best known today as the leading apologist for human polygenism, the theory of independent human ethnicities and separate creations, the various human races, in accordance with this theory, being endowed, endowed with unequal capacities. This was then used uh, as a, a form of apology for, at the time for slavery uh, in the southern states. This is not the element of Agassiz's thinking that I'm going to discuss now. Rather, my focus will be on aspects of the place of tangible things in Agassiz's scientific practice. In 1827, Agassiz moved from the University of Heidelberg to the University of Munich. There he learned from his professor of anatomy and physiology, Ignaz Döllinger, the techniques and advantages of careful observation. In his autobiographical sketch, he wrote, with Döllinger, I learned to value the accuracy of observation. As I was living in his house, he gave me personal instruction in the use of the microscope. Döllinger was a careful, minute, persevering observer, as well as a deep thinker. Agassiz retained and developed this habit of close observation throughout his career and it informed the extraordinary care he took over the visual representation of his subjects in his publications. He was responsible through his associates for some of the most exacting, and I would claim aesthetically compelling, reproductive illustrations of extinct and contemporary creatures ever made. Yet at Munich, Agassiz also absorbed the practice of working with a priori claims. He learned to value their standing from such grand theorists as the philosopher naturalist Lorenz Ocken, who began his academic career at Jena as a somewhat wayward protege of Goethe, and the philosopher Friedrich Schelling, who also owed his academic position to Goethe. In the fall of 1828, Ocken and Schelling lectured each week in the same hall in succession. From Ocken and Schelling, Agassiz learned that there need be no contradiction between minute and precise observation of specimens and a priori principles. For according to his teachers, such data was reflective of ideal representations of final purpose and fixed cause. That purpose and cause, they suggested, was ordered in accordance with a divine plan in this divine plan, creatures were the earthly manifestations of a transcendental ideal. Now, we should bear in mind that the form of attention we associate with natural history specimens as an entirely dispassionate scientific or forensic undertaking was foreign 
to Agassiz and his contemporaries, particularly those with a German academic background, for whom art and science were equally aspects of the human or indeed divine spirit. Art scholars, such as the Englishman John Smith, no less than scientists, such as Agassiz, applied a close description of physical characteristics to their chosen bodies of material and systematic categorization by medium, school, and individual artist. So Smith's catalogue raisonné of the most eminent Dutch, Flemish, and French painters, published in nine volumes between 1829 and 1842, is in many respects a project analogous to Agassiz's five-volume Poisson Fossile, of 1833 to 43. Now Smith's categorizations and attributions had no basis beyond his own empirical knowledge and experience as an art dealer and were criticized on those grounds by his academic German rival, uh, the philosophically educated museum director Gustav Friedrich Wagen. Yet in the German influenced world, scientists, no less than art scholars, were taking aesthetic considerations concerning their material into account, profoundly affecting the collection, exchange, and display of fossils and other natural specimens. So consider, for example, this fossil skull of the chimeroid fish, Edifon Sedgwickii. Now, Louis Agassiz identified and defined this species and named it in honor of, in honor of the Cambridge geologist, Adam Sedgwick, that's Cambridge, England. At the Sedgwick Museum of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge, it's presented like an objet d'art on a velvet-covered base beneath a glass dome edged with crimson chenille. In the same museum, we find examples of fossils prepared in shadow boxes, like sculptural reliefs by dealers to fit into aesthetically conceived private collections, no less than into new scientific museums. And here's one example, a Pentacrinus subancularis prepared by Mary Anning of Lyme Regis. Even in the 1870s, exemplary objects of both art and natural history could be exhibited together. A photograph from about 1874 shows that the natural history room in Boylston Hall at Harvard exhibited not only zoological specimens, including a giant clam, which I think you can see down here, and a mastodon skeleton, uh, but also casts of such celebrated antique statues as the Venus de Medici and the Borghese warrior. Aesthetic and scientific forms of attention were still regarded as part of the same single task of understanding the world as they had been in Kant's Critique of the Power of Judgment in 1790 or Schelling's System of Transcendental Idealism in, the, in 1800. The strict segregation of aesthetic from scientific forms of attention, no less than of artworks from natural history specimens, was yet to come. Now, in 1831, Agassiz moved to Paris to become the protégé of Georges Cuvier at the Muséum National d'Histoire Naturelle. From Cuvier, he learned the forensic skills on which he based his subsequent researches, notably the method of applying the principle of the correlation of parts to reconstruct fragmentary fossil remnants. Now, this allowed the adept scientist to infer the complete animal from just one surviving part of its body. Further, that adept scientist should then be able to place the reconstructed creature within the natural order of species. Further yet, Agassiz learned to relate fossil remains of long extinct species to living creatures, so that the historical and the contemporary might form a single unit of experience and consideration. Now this is not to say that he acknowledged developmental or evolutionary connections among them. Agassiz accepted Cuvier's assertion that there was no evidence of species having developed from other species. Rather, Agassiz followed Cuvier in holding that species were immutable. Now, Agassiz's work on gla glaciers and the effects of ice reinforced his belief that species are immutable. In 1837, he introduced the concept of the Ice Age, 
to account for geological phenomena caused by glaciation. We take the Ice Age for granted, but generally are not really aware where this idea comes from. Well, it's Agassiz. His proposal that a vast sheet of ice had advanced southwards during the Pleistocene epoch to the borders of the Mediterranean and the Caspian Seas allowed him to, to develop a new theory of catastrophism to account for species loss. So previously, species loss had been uh, accounted for by the biblical flood. Agassiz proposed that it was the glaciation that caused this. Now this theory accommodated his claims of new and discrete post-glacial creations, each confined to its particular appropriate part of the world. And it's generally forgotten that it was Agassiz who introduced this idea of the Ice Age. Agassiz's conception of what we would now call intelligent design accorded well with ideas regarding the divinity of a complex creation, familiar to many New Englanders from the transcendentalist lectures and publications of Ralph Waldo Emerson and his associates. Their group, known as the Transcendentalists, uh, their group effort had been focused on the journal The Dial, published in Boston only between 1840 and 1844 with the wonderful Margaret Fuller as its editor. But when Agassiz arrived in Boston in late 1846, the emphasis he brought with him on the detailed observation of scientific elements of the natural world also found an, an echo in Emerson's circle. Agassiz had relied on collections, both private and institutional, throughout Europe in order to be able to write Poissons Fossiles. Among the most important collections of fossils and extant creatures was his own. He set about acquiring specimens as soon as he arrived in Boston, relying on a network of intellectually sympathetic new acquaintances. And among them was Henry David Thoreau. As Richard Smith has recently established, in the spring of 1847, Agassiz asked Thoreau, then living in his cabin at Walden Pond, to procure natural history specimens for him. Now, how this came about, I've not been able to discover. Perhaps the connection was through Thaddeus Harris, who had been, uh, who had been Thoreau's teacher uh, of natural history at Harvard. Perhaps the link was Emerson. But Smith reports that, and I quote, Thoreau caught and sent off to Harvard College pouts, perch, breams, minnows, several kinds of tortoise, a black snake, some shiners, and amazingly, a live fox, all to the delight of Agassiz. To these, as we shall see, we can also add a native mouse. Once Agassiz had decided to accept a chair at Harvard and not return to Europe, the college treasurer purchased an unused bathhouse to accommodate his ever-growing collections. His assistants from Europe were kept busy preparing specimens and drawing them for lithographic reproduction under Agassiz's own supervision. And the results were some of the most spectacular and amazing book illustrations ever produced, such as this fold-out plate of the jellyfish Cyania arctica by Auguste Sorel after Jacques Burckhardt from Agassiz's monumental Contributions to the Natural History of North America, published between 1857 and 62. Now, Agassiz's specimens were also vital for teaching. When he began to teach at Harvard in the spring of 1848, it soon became clear that his method was not confined to the familiar lecture course, but included field trips to observe nature in place and the assigned examination by his students of individual specimens in great detail. So one first-hand reported, reported example of this aspect of Agassiz's teaching must stand for many. In his autobiography, Joseph LeConte, one of Agassiz's first students at Harvard and subsequently a professor at Berkeley, described the first assignment Agassiz set him and a fellow student. So this is, I'm quoting now, quoting LeConte. The first task Agassiz set us was very characteristic of the man. He thought a while, then pulled out a drawer containing from 500 to 1,000 separated valves of unios, that's bivalve mollusks, of from 50 to 100 different species, 
all mixed together and said, pair these valves and classify into species. Names, no matter. Separate the species. He left us alone, very severely alone. We worked on those shells for one whole week, the professor looking at our work from time to time but making no remark. Finally, we told him that we'd done the best we could. He examined the results carefully and was much pleased. It so happened that just then there entered the room a friend of his from Europe, Ampère, the son of the great electrician. He introduced us and remarked that these pupils had just amended correctly the classification of Isaac Lee, the great authority on unios. Now for this kind of teaching, a museum was essential. So with the support, the financial support of Francis Calley Gray, Agassiz's methods and ambitions led to the founding in 1859 of the museum within the university that Agassiz himself named the Museum of Comparative Zoology. It became and has remained one of the principal American engines of research and scholarship on vertebrate and invertebrate creatures, currently housing something over 21 million specimens, including many type specimens, that is the specimens that serve as ultimate references for the definitions of species. Remember that, that date, 1859. Charles Darwin, with whom Agassiz had corresponded amicably, had published On the Origin of Species in that same year, proposing the instability of species, natural selection, responsiveness to local environment, and evolution. These were ideas with which Agassiz, true to Cuvier's principles, profoundly disagreed and would continue to do so for the rest of his life. For all his extraordinary attention to the particularities of specimens from the natural world, Agassiz would always adhere to the principles that Darwin set out to refute, eventually leading to his intellectual and academic isolation. Yet, for the time being, Agassiz was anything but isolated. He enjoyed warm relationships with the extraordinary inhabitants of Boston, Cambridge, and Concord, among them Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Emerson and Agassiz were faithful members of the Saturday Club, a small men's dining club that met monthly from 1856 onwards, usually in Boston. Emerson and his wife, Lydian, placed their two daughters in the school for girls run by Agassiz's wife, Elizabeth Carey Agassiz, who would become the first president of Radcliffe College. Emerson had a high regard for Agassiz, and on November 13th, 1860, Emerson was among the worthies who attended the dedication ceremony of the new Museum of Comparative Zoology. But Agassiz quarreled with his Harvard colleague, the great botanist, Asa Gray, who publicly espoused Darwin's principles and who bested Agassiz in debate. In late 1864, Agassiz was even rumored to have challenged Gray in Heidelberg fashion to a duel. <laughs> then between April 1865 and August 1866, Agassiz undertook his major foreign expedition, known after its sponsor, Nathaniel Thayer, as the Thayer Expedition. This was to Brazil. The expedition served both to remove Agassiz from a personally intolerable situation and also to procure evidence to refute the spread of Darwin's ideas. As Luke Menand puts it, it was a mission with a mission. Agassiz intended to gather evidence that would disprove the theories of Charles Darwin and knowing in advance exactly what he was looking for, he found it. <laughs> the Brazilian government and the emperor, Dom Pedro II, personally, provided many amenities, and Agassiz developed a close and lasting relationship with the emperor. The Thayer expedition was a large-scale enterprise, for Agassiz was able to bring not only his wife, Elizabeth Carey Agassiz, but also four fellow scientists, six of his students, and his long-term collaborator, Jack Burkhardt. Burkhardt was an accomplished artist who'd studied in Munich and Rome.
His watercolour sketchbook of Roman views from 1828 survives in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Burkhardt had collaborated with Agassiz on the plates for the Poisson Fossil and had followed Agassiz to America from Neuchâtel in 1847, where he worked on the illustrations for Agassiz's four-volume Contributions to the Natural History of North America. In Brazil, he turned his landscape skills to good effect, producing numerous watercolour scenes. Many of these were subsequently adapted as illustrations to the book A Journey in Brazil, Louis and Elizabeth Agassiz's account of the Thayer expedition, published in 1868. Now, other than some interpolations by her husband, the book was the work of Elizabeth Agassiz. And here's a flavor of her vivid descriptions as the party rested, having come ashore. So they've been going down the Amazon River. Some of the party, Elizabeth Agassiz wrote, are lounging in hammocks, which have, we have slung under the great porch as we are to pass several hours here. An improvised rustic table consisting of a board resting on forked sticks stands at one side. The boatmen are clearing away the remains of our last repast. The Indian women, dirty, half-clad, with their hair hanging uncombed around their faces, are tending their native children or kneading mandioca in a huge trough. The men of the house have just returned from fishing, the morning having been more successful in that respect than was expected, and are now fitting up a rough forge in which they are repairing some of their iron instruments. In the meantime, science, with a capital S, has its sacred corner where Mr. Agassiz is investigating new species, the result of the morning's fishing, while Mr. Burkhart is drawing them. Burkhard made innumerable sketches of specimens, notably fish, collected in both the Rio de Janeiro area, where the expedition first spent its first three months, and on the Amazon. Now, Agassiz's curiosity was not confined to natural history alone. He also recorded the appearance of human inhabitants, notably when they exhibited an appearance that seemed unusual to him and his companions, and in particular to illustrate what he termed, and I quote, the evil of this mixture of races. For this, he used both photography, and we see here a photograph, one of a number that have only just come to the surface, uh, from the archives of the Peabody Museum by his student, Walter Hunnewell, a young woman photographed in Manaus. Pho photography and draftsmanship. He expressed a high respect for racially pure Indians, but railed against racial intermixture so prevalent in Brazil. Nonetheless, Elizabeth Agassiz wrote of this picture, which we see, uh, the adjoining sketch, I'm now quoting Elizabeth Agassiz, is a portrait of my little housemaid, Alexandrina, who from her mixture of Negro and Indian blood is rather a curious illustration of the amalgamation of races here. In the examples of Negro and Indian half-breeds we have seen, the Negro type seems the first to yield, as if the more facile disposition of the Negro, as compared with the ten enduring tenacity of the Indian, showed itself in their physical as well as their mental characteristics. Now, Louis Agassiz described Alexandrina himself, making a point, not as one might expect, of her ethnic physical characteristics, but of her skills, even if his concluding simile makes us cringe. So Louis Agassiz wrote of Alexandrina, Alexandrina turns out to be a valuable addition to the household, not only from a domestic, but also from a scientific point of view. She has learned to prepare and clean skeletons of fish very nicely and makes herself quite useful in the laboratory. Besides, she knows many paths in the forest and accompanies me in all my botanizing excursions. With the keen perceptions of a person whose only training has been through the senses, she is far quicker than I am in discerning the smallest plant in fruit or flower. And now she knows what I am seeking. She is very a very efficient aid. Nimble as a monkey, she thinks nothing of climbing to the top of a tree to bring down a blossoming branch. 
Now, the artist responsible for Alexandrina's drawn portrait from which the woodcut, this woodcut was derived, and this might surprise you, was one of the student members of the Thayer expedition, none other than the future psychologist and philosopher William James, then a student at the Harvard Medical School. Yeah, it is a really surprising. That's William James in Brazil. <laughs> Writing to his father, James exhibited both his resistance to Agassiz's theorizing and his admiration of his professor's dedication and detailed learning. So I quote William James writing to his father from Brazil. I have profited a great deal by hearing Agassiz talk, not so much by what he says, for never did a man utter a greater amount of humbug, but by learning the way of feeling of such a vast practical engine as he is. No one sees further into a generalization than his knowledge of details extends. And you have a greater feeling of weight and solidity about the movement of Agassiz's mind, owing to the continual presence of this great background of special facts than about the mind of any other man I know. So although he had to leave the expedition after eight months owing to illness, James sketched a caricature of its triumphant return as a procession of porters, animals, and carts bearing specimens. I hope you can make this out. This is the, the head of the procession, and it's winding round like this. It's, a, it's stick men. It's, it's very much a kind of caricature. And it includes a huge faceted geometric form here, which you might just be able to make out on a cart, which is labeled large diamond from the emp. That's the emperor Don Pedros. And a figure representing Agassiz here, this is Agassiz, is holding a placard that reads four trillion new species of fish. <laughs> In his subsequent philosophical contributions, however, James would return to the tradition from which the comical, if admirable, Agassiz derived and change the focus of attention from the object itself and the characteristics it exhibits to the individual's experience of that object. It followed, James believed, that objective analysis can never halt the world or human experience of it. According to James, the very process of observation itself will affect the result of any empirical attempt to establish veracity, owing to the inseparability of the mind, its experiences, and nature. As Robert Brandom argues, William James takes us, and I quote Brandom, from German idealism to American pragmatism and back. Now, I don't believe he does this quite alone, for the epistemological paradigm that saw extensive collections of many kinds of tangible things established both within universities and as in independent museums depended for its efficacy on belief in disinterested, accurate observation advanced by scholars whose claims kept in tension the incremental accumulation of vast quantities of empirical data derived from those tangible things, and assumptions about realities that transcended those objects of experience. How a pragmatic, if not pragmatist, mindset might nonetheless have an affinity for German idealism is suggested by the second all-American contributor to Massachusetts museum culture I'm going to consider, Henry David Thoreau. But in Thoreau's case, it is not as with Agassiz Schelling, whose shadow we find in the background, but the progenitor of idealism himself, Immanuel Kant. Thoreau may well have been Emerson's protege, indebted to him for intellectual stimulation no less than for material support in his role as gardener and odd job man to the sage of Concord, but he was quite recalcitrantly his own man. There was a profound difference of ideas between the two thinkers concerning tangible things and what might be learned from them. Speaking of things constitutive of the world in his 1837 address at Harvard's commencement, Emerson claimed that if you, and I quote, show me the sublime presence 
of the highest spiritual cause lurking, as always it does, bristling with the polarity that ranges it instantly on the eternal law, then the world lies no longer a dull miscellany and lumber room, but has form and order. There is no trifle, there is no puzzle, but one design unites and animates the furthest pinnacle and the lowest trench. Thoreau, in contrast, is far more circumspect when considering tangible things, as his discussion, Brute Neighbours, in Walden, published in 1854, suggests. Thoreau writes of the animals that inhabit the woodlot and its environs at Walden Pond, just south of Concord, where he famously lived between 1845 and 1847 in a cabin he built himself. Following an introductory dialogue about fishing between a hermit, representing himself, and his visitor, a poet, likely representing Emerson or his friend Ellery Channing, Thoreau parodies idealism by abandoning meditation to go fishing, thereby suggesting that what is of value, spirit, is not to be found in the mind alone, but by direct experience of nature, within nature, not as for Emerson, through it. As Richard Schneider points out, and I quote, once one recognizes this dualistic debate between the transcendentalist, transcendentalist and the naturalist in Thoreau's attitude, every natural object that he describes takes on a double meaning, one physical and one symbolic. Now the dialogue concluded, Thoreau begins a new section of the chapter in his own authorial voice with the hortatory question, why do precisely these objects which we behold make a world? I want to examine this question with a little care, attending to its precision, a precision that Thoreau's own use of the term precisely might suggest is appropriate. As I'm sure you all know, Thoreau wrote and rewrote his, his works repeatedly. Again and again, he was, he was obsessed with precise uh, expression in words. Thoreau writes of these objects which we behold, these being the brute neighbours that are the subject of the chapter. He begins with the mice which haunted my house, which were not common ones which are said to have been introduced into the country, but a wild native kind not found in the village. He continues, I sent one to a distinguished naturalist and it interested him much. That distinguished naturalist was Louis Agassiz. Thoreau then writes of birds, phoebes, robins, partridges, woodcock, wood, woodcock and turtle doves. And there follows a detailed description of a battle between red and black ants and how he took a wood chip on which a black ant was fighting two red ants into his cabin where he placed it on a windowsill beneath a tumbler and studied the co combat under what he calls a microscope, which is actually a single lens. He then describes the annual arrival in the fall of the loon, and he concludes this chapter by describing in detail his study of its behavior from his boat. The loon is a kind of duck. He accomplishes all this with great precision, during which we keep in mind his initial question, why do precisely these objects which we behold make a world? We've heard from Thoreau's, we've heard Thoreau's mentor, Emerson, write of the constitution of the world. But Thoreau, in contrast, uses the indefinite article, for he writes most precisely of a world. And this signals a difference of conception that is all the difference in the world. Unlike Emerson, Thoreau does not assume the existence of a totality that exists as such, the spiritual character and meaning of which we might attempt to grasp in its entirety. Thoreau accedes to the principle of contingency, acknowledging multiple possible viewpoints. He sketches those of the hermit and the poet specifically on this occasion in the introductory passage. And each of these viewpoints encompasses a world. We may be far as yet from Nelson Goodman's ways of world making, but Thoreau's worlds are prismatic and not necessarily wholly compatible and reconcilable in their aggregate entirety. They are worlds, 
each world coheres by comprising its own selection of objects. Thoreau engaged in such selection repeatedly and in various registers, first by means of observation and description, such as we find in Brute Neighbours, and second by means of collection. Thoreau collected in several categories, and this is really not very well known. I want to mention two, indigenous artefacts and animal specimens. Thoreau was constantly aware of the past presence in particular localities of indigenous peoples. In his discussion of his bean field in Walden, he notes, in the course of the summer, it appeared by the arrowheads which I turned up in hoeing that an extinct nation had anciently dwelt here and planted corn and beans ere white men came to clear the land. Nathaniel Hawthorne, describing his own pro proclivity for gathering Indian artifacts on the land surrounding the old manse in Concord, admitted that Thoreau had first set him on the search and that Thoreau had, in Hawthorne's words, a strange faculty of finding what the Indians have left behind them. Thoreau took a long-term interest in many material remains of earlier inhabitants that he found over the decades, recording his observations and reflections in his journal. He knew from experience that fall ploughing and winter frost heaves turned up Indian implements, noting on finding three arrowheads on November 16th, 1850, that the season for them began some time ago, as soon as farmers had sown their winter rye, but the spring after the melting of the snow is still better. I'll just show you a few more Indian lithic artifacts from Thoreau's collection. This wonderful atle atle weight. He amassed perhaps as many as 900 indigenous artifacts by the time of his death. Thoreau's collecting in the field was not confined to human made things, but ranged extensively over the natural world. His method combined non invasive observation and non destructive gathering. Now these are habits we may take for granted now, but they were novel enough in his day to warrant comment. His frequent walking companion and his first biographer, the poet Ellery Channing, whom Thoreau likely parodies as the poet in Brute Neighbours, uh, drew a distinction between Thoreau's procedures and the violent collecting that was then the norm. This is Channing. Hawks, ducks, sparrows, thrushes, and migrating warblers, in all their variety, he carefully perused with his field glass, an instrument purchased with toilsome discretion and carried in its own strong case and pocket. Thoreau named all the birds without a gun, a weapon he never used in mature years. He neither killed nor imprisoned any animal unless driven by acute needs. And this account deserves comment. The standard way of identifying birds at this time was to shoot them so that each dead body could be closely examined and the bird classified. This is what we see in, in uh, Orbison's uh, wonderful uh, uh, images of, of the birds uh, of America. They're all dead. Identification manuals were published to aid the ornithologist. And we have here Alexander Wilson's American Ornithology, first published in nine volumes between 1808 and 1814. And its descriptions are based on the examination of dead birds, not the observation of living ones. Thoreau owned the 1852 edition. In a journal entry uh, in March 1853, Thoreau mused on the advantages of the spyglass over the gun. He wrote, would it not be well to carry a spyglass in order to watch these shy birds, such as ducks and hawks? In some respects, methinks it would be better than a gun. The latter brings them nearer, dead, but the former, alive. You can identify the species better by killing the bird because it was a dead specimen that was so minutely described. But you can study the habits and appearance best in the living specimen. He tried out a spyglass in June, and 10 months later, in April 1854, he bought his own for $8. And this is it. I'm afraid it's my own photograph uh, taken in late afternoon light in the Concord Museum. He carried it with him constantly. 
Channing further noted, his pockets were large enough to hold and keep not only his implements, but the large multitude of objects which he brought home from, him, brought home from his walks, objects of all kinds, pieces of wood or stone, lichens, seeds, nuts, apples, or whatever he had found for his uses, for he was a vigorous collector, never omitting to get and keep every possible thing in this direction of study. So Thoreau squirreled away his finds of all kinds in his attic study, as described by Channing. He tucked plants away in his soft hat in place of a botany box. His study, a place in the garret, held its dry miscellany of bot botanical specimens, its corner of canes, its cases of eggs and lichens, and a weight of Indian arrowheads and hatchets, besides a store of nuts of which he was as fond as squirrels. Now, what principles lay behind Thoreau's relentless practice of observation, description, and collection? This was more than a set of habits he had acquired while an undergraduate at Harvard between 1833 and 1837, where he'd been taught by the botanist, uh, entomologist, and librarian Thaddeus William Harris. Though, as his journal reveals, Thoreau maintained a personal relationship with Harris until the latter's death in 1856, visiting him regularly. Thoreau was principally and unswervingly concerned with what Channing epitomized as the particular and definite. The particular and definite were much to Thoreau, Channing wrote in his 1873 memoir of the philosopher. He made this remark in the course of an instructive episode in their friendship that occurred in November, on November 9th, 1851, during one of their regular walks. Describing it, Channing quotes Thoreau's manuscript journal entry, self-interestedly but understandably omitting Thoreau's more critical remarks about his friend. So I will quote here the original passage from Thoreau's journal. In our walks, C, that is Channing, takes out his notebook and sometimes and tries to write as I do, but all in vain. He soon puts it up again, or contents himself with scrawling some sketch of the landscape. Observing me still scribbling, he will say that he confines himself to the ideal, purely ideal remarks. He leaves the facts to me. Sometimes, too, he will say a little petulantly, I am universal. I have nothing to do with the particular and the definite. He is the moodiest person, perhaps, that I ever saw. I too would fain set down something beside facts. Facts should only be as the frame to my pictures. They should be material to the mythology which I am writing. Not facts to assist men to make money, farmers to farm profitably in any common sense. Facts to tell who I am and where I have been or what I have thought. My facts shall be falsehoods to the common sense. I would so state facts that they shall be significant, shall be myths or mythologic. Facts which the mind perceived, thoughts which the body thought with these ideal. I too cherish vague and misty forms, vaguest when the cloud at which I gaze is dissipated quite and naught but the skyey depths are seen. The particular and definite, as they constitute a world, whether of botany, zoology, geology, or the history of indigenous peoples, are, in Thoreau's estimate, significant only insofar as they are what he terms mythologic. They overturn received opinion. They are falsehoods to the common sense. Yet the pictures he would make had to be framed by facts. Channing reported, his habit was to go abroad a portion of each day to fields or woods or the Concord River. I go out, he said, to see what I have caught in my traps which I set for facts. As Channing perceptively summarized Thoreau's purpose, he looked to fabricate an epitome of creation and give us a homeopathy of nature. Thoreau's mature reflections on the character of scientific inquiry in the Friday chapter of a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, published in 1849, reveal that its basis is observation rather than experiment, but not observation that might cause distraction by the mere incremental accumulation of facts. 
He writes, Observation is so wide awake and facts are being so rapidly added to the sum of human experience that it appears as if the theoriser would always be in arrears and were doomed forever to arrive at imperfect conclusions. But the power to perceive a law is equally rare in all ages of the world and depends but little on the number of facts observed. So Thoreau qualifies this undertaking in two ways. First, that power to perceive a law is peculiarly dependent on the experience of the scientist. As he expresses it, how can we know what we are told merely? Each man can interpret another's experience only by his own, and, with, and that's the original emphasis. How can we know what we are told merely? Each man can interpret another's experience only by his own. Second, for Thoreau, the perception of scientific laws is above all a moral undertaking. The laws of nature, he wrote, are the purest morality. This is why they are a part of what he would later come to denote as the mythologic. Thanks to his preoccupation with the particular and the definite, Thoreau thought his way back through Emerson's transcendentalism to its roots in Kant. For Kant thinks that the world as a whole is not knowable by us. The universal laws we believe to operate in nature originate in ourselves. I am the universal. And that demand for the universal is inseparable from the foundations of morality within us. The quality of the mythologic therefore holds in tension the double meanings of things derived from transcendentalist idealism, imbibed especially from Emerson on the one hand, and attention to things in themselves as constituents of a world, a significant but not knowably all-encompassing unity on the other. One means by which Thoreau negotiated this tension was by adopting the prophetic mode that Stanley Cavell so perceptively discerns in Thoreau's most uncompromisingly apodictic text, Walden. For both Agassiz and Thoreau, the collection and extremely detailed examination of tangible things was essential and innovable. While Agassiz was relentlessly gathering specimens for the Museum of Comparative Zoology, Thoreau continued to collect too. He'd long been gathering material on the indigenous inhabitants of North America. He compiled what was to become a series of 12 manuscript notebooks, now in the J. Pierpont Morgan Library in New York, under the title extracts relating to the Indians, most likely with a book in mind that he did not live to write. He gathered information firsthand about Indian ways during his expeditions with indigenous guides to wilderness areas of northern Maine in 1846, 1853 and 1857, and to Minnesota in 1861 to meet with the Dakota peoples. But Thoreau, suffering from tuberculosis, died at the age of 44 the following year. As a scientist, as in everything else, Thoreau had remained an outsider beyond institutional enclosure. However, like his teacher Thaddeus William Harris, he was a member of the Boston Society of Natural History, founded in 1830. And to this body, he not only donated specimens during his lifetime, but also bequeathed his natural history and indigenous artifact collections. The bequest took effect on Thoreau's death in 1862, which was the year the society began building its new museum in Boston. Just four years later, in 1866, the London-based banker George Peabody donated funds for a museum and professorship in American archaeology and ethnology to Harvard, and this led to the construction in 1869 of the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology as an extension to the building housing Agassiz's Museum of Comparative Zoology. The first curator of the Peabody Museum was Jeffreys Wyman, Hersey Professor of Anatomy at Harvard since 1847 and President of the Boston Society for Natural History since 1854. In 1866, Wyman chose the position at the new Harvard Museum over the directorship of the newly built New England Museum of Natural History, founded by the Boston Society of Natural History. And the society took advantage of the founding of the Peabody Museum to divest itself of its archaeological materials. And these were sent with Wyman to the new Harvard Museum. 
among the materials from the Boston Society of Natural History that Wyman received into the new Peabody Museum was therefore the group of Indian materials left by Thoreau. The museum received them when its new building was complete in 1869. And this is two facing pages from the original museum register, which shows uh, these are two pages of many uh, of the uh, Thoreau Indian material. As Stephen Conn has demonstrated, soon after the beginning of the 20th century, museums lost much of their academic authority in natural history and anthropology, if not in the study of art, to universities where scholars attended to intangibles. The three major museums were founded in Boston and Cambridge in the 10 years between 1859 and 1869. The Museum of Comparative Zoology, the New England Museum of Natural History of the Boston Society of Natural History, which is now the Museum of Science, and the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. And all three in their various ways instantiated forms of scholarship that held in various degrees of tension principles derived both from idealism and an urge to observe the world or worlds closely by gathering materials for further methodical empirical study that might reveal underlying principles of organization. Two of the men responsible for this local development that had national implications knew each other, though their educations, fields of interest and attitudes could scarcely have been more different from one another. One is an acknowledged founding figure of American museum scholarship, Louis Agassiz. The other, Henry David Thoreau, is scarcely associated with museum scholarship, despite having employed collecting as a vital aspect of his philosophical inquiry, and despite his collection of indigenous artifacts having contributed to the formation of a leading anthropology museum. The ripples of these forms of inquiry radiated from Cambridge before fading in the early 20th century. Although all three museums, the MCZ, Museum of Comparative Zoology, the Science Museum, and the Peabody, continue to exist. George Brown Good's uh, 1895 taxonomy of taxonomies, uh, the principles of museum administration, was in effect a last hurrah for the then as yet scarcely challenged scholarly authority of collecting institutions. And George Brown Good was a Harvard graduate, an ichthyologist by training, a fish man, a student of none other than Louis Agassiz. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Which is now open for questions, commentaries, This is this is not photoshopped. This is this is Stanford uh, after the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, and there was a uh, there were statues of scientific worthies uh, on the parapet of this building. And this is what happened to poor Louis Agassiz. And it seems, uh, in a sense, rather uh, unfortunately prophetic uh, and appropriate. Um, as I mentioned, he was he's now really only thought of in terms of his, of his totally wrong-headed uh, racial theories. Uh, and and it's, it's something of a shame that his other work, which was so groundbreaking, has been uh, eclipsed by this bad, this bad reputation. Is the, is the, the connection that you make here between the, the art of observation almost, the passion of observation, and the, the philosophy that inspired that, is that a unique moment for Massachusetts 1860s, or is this part of a wider connection between collecting, quite a few of the collections here, you could ask the same question, um, and a sort of philosophical, not mirror, but 
prison in the world? I think so. But I think it's very, to my mind, it's important to bear in mind the specificity of each set of social circumstances. So as I was uh, trying to indicate at the beginning, if you look at what was happening in Philadelphia uh, at much the same time, you could point to connections among institutions and among individuals uh, what was happening there that was rather different from what was happening in Boston. And I'm sure what was happening in Göttingen uh, as well. So yes, there are, I think there are connections between this kind of, this emergence of observational science, which in a way we tend to, we tend to forget about because we pay such attention to the emergence of, of experimental science. And observational science tends to get sort of pushed to the background, whereas that was so important in the 19th century. It remains hugely important now, uh, particularly in, in natural history. And of course, it remains so in the astronomical sciences. It's rather appropriate to be in this building thinking about that. Uh, so, but I think that this, uh, this very conscious uniting of, of high metaphysical ideas with the nitty gritty of looking at stuff is probably happened in a, only in a certain number of places with this kind of intensity. And it certainly happened with, with, a, with a real intensity in, uh, in and around Boston, Massachusetts at this time. Um, thank you very much indeed. It was very intriguing. Um, it work? Thank you. Um, I was actually thinking about the, the cabinet of curiosities in Central Europe in the 17th and 18th century. And I wonder, do you see um, some kind of tradition there? Because as far as I know, there have been quite a few, in, especially in the Netherlands, from, um, from people what we would like to call connoisseurs, uh, knowledgeable, knowledgeable um, actually scientists, researchers, uh, doctors, whatever. And they took great interest in um, collecting shells and whatever kind of fish pieces and categorizing them. Yes. So would you see um, a line of tradition there, some kind of cultural uh, constancy? I think there's an, ep an, an epistemological shift. Mm -hmm. And I think that the shift one can characterize, it's, it's quite complicated. So what I'm going to say is, is too simple, really. But it's a shift from the unusual, the, uh, the unique, the, the thing that is very difficult to classify because is it, is coral an animal or a plant? So great interest in coral in collections of, of the, the Kunst und Wunderkammer. That's, so it, it's the unclassifiable. A shift to a, an interest in what is typical, in the specimen, in the thing that is representative of uh, many others of the same kind. And I think this, this, is, a real, this is a real change. This doesn't, but it isn't, as, it isn't as straightforward as that. Because I think, as I tried to, uh, to, to describe in my remarks, all too briefly, there remained a fascination with the particular characteristics, even of the typical. So that as uh, new types of species are discovered and identified, whether, uh, whether these are uh, fossil remains or living things, so there is a, a, a willingness to attend to their particular characteristics in their own right, not simply as a way of, as a means to an end of categorizing. So uh, it's, there's an ambiguity there, I think. So yes, there is a, co a continuity, but there's also a change. <coughs> this question. Does extinction play a role um, in, in their research and collecting? I mean, I don't know if they work so closely together with museums, if one might imagine that um, species, species that are about to be extinct, extinct might be um, of special interest to them, or is that Right. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating question. Um, of course, with the fossil remains, a man like Agassiz 
with his fossil fish studies, is dealing with extinct, ex extinct species. I think the way in which extinction is accounted for, this, this undergoes a radical shift in the 19th century. Uh, so how does, how does this happen? How, Agassiz believes in these discrete creations and that any given species exists only in one often very small part of the world. And so he's interested in trying to find these, you know, however many it was, three, seven trillion spe new species of fish. Of course, he didn't find that many because he was working according to a set of principles that scientists now don't hold by. Um, but how to account for this? I think Agassiz's idea of, of glaciation was a huge change. Previously, as we know, extinction had been accounted for uh, in the 18th century and, and well into the 19th century by uh, the cat catastrophe of the flood. And so this is how you could say, well, these things were, were created. They didn't survive the flood. And so we have this new creation after the flood. But Agassiz, he only puts forward the idea of a single ice age. We now have multiple ice ages. But he's, he's coming up with a new way of accounting for this. Now, how this relates to living things, uh, it's Agassiz is interested in, in the way in which species are very locally uh, occurring. So this is one of the reasons that he goes to Brazil, because he thinks he's going to be able to find innumerable species of fish that don't exist anywhere else. And to an extent, he's, he's right, but not to the extent that he wished for. Uh, so the, uh, the whole thing of looking for new species in living in nature is, is something that uh, then becomes complicated by uh, Darwinism and the idea of mutability of species, and, you know, starting with Darwin's finches. Uh, I'm not sure that that really helps with what you are bringing up, but I, th I, th I think that this, this whole question of uh, what, what, are, what are naturalists turning their minds to? Uh, there's, there's no doubt that the publication in 1859 of, on the origin of species is a huge watershed. I mean, there's no denying that. But that doesn't mean to say that these older ideas didn't have a continuing life. Um, a follow up to this, and also uh, taking a uh, look at the kind of early modern prehistory of 19th century um, zoology and, and natural history, as you would call it. I mean, do you have, in, in the United States, is there any, uh, anything like similar that um, to Alex Cooper uh, called the inventing of the indigenous in early modern Europe? They also, they did not only go to Brazil or other places, but also they went from here to the hearts. To look at how this happened in nature there. And did they differentiate between what they did in Brazil and what they did in, in what is in, in Concord? Oh, yes. Um, and I think one finds this most particularly in, it's, to my, in my limited knowledge of this whole area. It's best illustrated by the career of Asa Gray in botany and the, uh, the, the exploration of, of American flora. Uh, where you have many, many, a much wider variety of difference between uh, the natural world in North, in North America and Europe in the flora than in the fauna. But there are obviously differences in the fauna as well. But it's really this uh, trying to get to grips with the particularities of American flora that, uh, that the, that, that, that's where a, a major focus Lay. Uh, Gray is, is contributing to this himself with the way in which soon after he arrives in North America uh, at Harvard, he launches into this huge project of, of the contributions to the natural history of North America. Uh, so I think that these people of European origin and European descent are very conscious of difference. Uh, it's I, I, what I'm one of the things that intrigues me is how indigenous knowledge comes into the picture. 
and how uh, people like George Catlin actually make great efforts to learn what indigenous peoples knew about the, uh, uh, about the natural world. Uh, and this, is, this goes on a kind of decline as the myth of the disappearing Indian grows in the course of the 19th century. 18th century European Americans took Indians seriously and acknowledged that they were part of history. Later in, in, the, in the 19th century, you start to get this idea that they are part of natural history and they become anthropolo anthropologized and turned into a, the ethnographic and a progressively denied a place in history. But so the idea that they have special knowledge that could be of great interest and even use begins to disappear in the course of the 19th century. Yeah. Is there any uh, uh, the connection between the theory, so to speak, mm -hmm. is there the connection between the theory and the collecting? Yes. Is, are there then different lines of working? Because on the one hand, it seemed to be that with Agassiz and the Soviet Army, mm -hmm. you would have a sort of Grand theory of the universe on that, yeah. that that drives the collecting mm -hmm. or is driven by the collecting. Yes. Whereas with Thoreau, mm -hmm. it seemed to be more a sort of the transcendental philosophy allows for the connection between the universal or the cosmological, whatever you want to call it, the transcendental, and the the, the specifics the specific you find on Earth. So yes. I mean that seems more almost like a life philosophy if you want. Mm -hmm. For collecting than the two others. The two others were driven by scientific um, urges. Or is yes. that too simple? I, I think it's, it's, it's easy to overlook the extent to which Thoreau's uh, work in this area, because it doesn't take place within an institutional context, because he's a, he's a pretty private man. He does not like going on the lecture circuit. He doesn't like, uh, he likes to publish, and he likes to be read, uh, but he publishes very little during his own lifetime. But what he does publish, actually, A Week on the Concord of Merrimack Rivers, does address these very questions, I think. And he is, he's, I think, trying to preserve the particularity while seeking to generalize but doesn't really know how to do it because he doesn't, he doesn't want to follow Emerson. He disagrees with Emerson profoundly about this. So he wants, I really think he does want to, to keep, he's in, in search of the mythologic, as he calls it, as I, as I mentioned. But what is that? It's, a, it's falsehoods to common sense. It goes against what you, what you would naturally assume uh, if you just come to something without really thinking about it. So it's those kind of things that he values. Um, and he values that in the specific. But I think he really does come to this realization that you can't aggregate the world into one meaningful thing. It's divided up into any number of discrete parts which can be kaleidoscopically recombined. And that seems to me to be a pretty profound set of thoughts. But is the interplay, <laughs> this is an elusive interplay between the collecting and the philosophy that leads to a different kind of philosophy. Yes. So yes. With the other two, you could put it a bit crudely and say, as you actually said about it, I guess, well, he was looking for something and he found it. Yeah. 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 Maybe the same point has been made about Darwin. Yes. Looking for something and he found he it. Found it. Yes. Yes. No, I, th I really think that just from reading the journals, uh, that Thoreau was, he was remarkably open to rethinking, and rethinking in the light of experience, rethinking in the light of what he founds in his traps set for facts. And he's constantly revising his ideas. Uh, what he didn't know how to do was, how do you then deal with that? How do you express that? And I think that's why uh, his texts are so incredibly difficult. 
Uh, and Walden, although it's in a sense it's an easy read, but it's, it isn't. It's a really very difficult thing to read. And he adopts this prophetic mode, and this is the way in which he can make the claims that he then wishes to make through assuming this kind of prophetic uh, way of expressing himself. And lots of what is most important in Thoreau's writing, I think, is it's not immediately apparent. It's things that seem to be really very straightforward and very simple actually are much more complicated than they, they see. And you know, it's Stanley Cavell is the person who, to whom I think we owe a great debt in interpreting this. Okay. Uh, one of the common topics in 19th century museum history is the connection between state building and museology. Yeah. So my question is, is in the American context or the, the Boston area context, is there a special way of connecting the way of the, the state is built up and museums are built like this impressive building <coughs> and this special foundation in idealism? Because in, in Germany, of course, German, German idealism and the state, yeah, they're like... Um, a love affair, yeah? Yeah, go together. Yes. Yes. No state without yes. idealism and no idealism without uh, fascination for state really. Yeah. And this intrigues me how, how does this fit into the American, American context? Are there idealists of the future state to build mm -hmm. up and with the heritage, um, with the last lack of tradition on the one side, but this um, variety of specimens of natural history mm -hmm. on the other side? I mean, a lack of cultural traditions. Uh, there's no, no Renaissance art in America, in North America, apart from European art brought mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of spe specimens. And how does this affect the, the context of the connection between state building and you know, the museology and museizing yes. artifacts? In I think what, what this comes down to is, is the very deep and troubling question that all Euro, Euro Americans who think about anything at all ask themselves, what are we doing here? Why are we here? And so much of American uh, uh, thinking and striving and political action uh, is including museum building uh, and the building of institutions that, uh, that of which museums can be a part, like universities, in the, in the instance of the, of the Museum of Comparative Zoology and the Peabody Museum, that these are ways of trying to grapple with that puzzle of what, by what right are we here? And I don't think that, the, that, the, that a sense of, of a lack of past is really the issue here. Because insofar as Americans wanted to have a sense of, that is Euro-Americans wanted to have a sense of past, they, they'd come from Europe. Now, obviously, thinkers like Emerson were extremely keen to propose an American particularism, that is a Euro-American particularism, so that, yes, they are, acknowledge their European origins, have lots of European ties, Emerson travels to Europe, he has European correspondence, friends, and what have you. Yet he is very, very distinctly proposing a Euro-American particularism. And I think that is part of what then informs the foundation of some of these institutions. Um, however, there is another side to this, and Thoreau represents this other side, which is an acknowledgement that this is not a new world, that the Americas, we'd have no right to call it a new world. It is historically deep in terms of human inhabitation <coughs> and uh, in terms of the profundity of that, of, of the achievements of those who inhabited that world, that, those places. And Thoreau is one of the most I think one of the most interesting thinkers along that line, which was a tradition that was, if you like, coming to an end at that time rather than beginning. This is something that uh, 18th and earlier 19th century American thinkers were perfectly at home with, the idea that, that this is a place with a deep past. Uh, Europeans are recent arrivals, but they can somehow be grafted on to this deep past. 
Now, how this actually feeds into nation building, well, the sense in which Harvard becomes, is changed in the mid 19th century over a number of, of, of years from uh, what had been a theological college uh, and a, a finishing school for gentlemen to a, a major world research university on a German model uh, that is, that is um, if not nation building, it's certainly society building in a particular, with a particular agenda. Um, I think we, we have to remember that these are, uh, they're not governmental institutions, they're all private, private if corporate institutions. Uh, Harvard University is, is, a, is well, privately, privately endowed, privately funded, then as now. The Boston Society of Natural History is as well. So this is not getting government funds, not even local, I mean, not even from Massachusetts. So to, to see, I, we, there is no parallel with the investment by uh, governments in European states in universities and museums. There's no parallel with that. The, the closest is the Smithsonian Institution, which was the result of a, uh, of a bequest. Uh, so the, the foundation of the Smithsonian was not at the, on the initiative of, of the federal government. It then comes under the wing of the federal government and remains so. But it's, it's as though this whole uh, idea of nation building is something that is in private corporate hands rather than a business of government. And that that's, is itself quite a distinction between Europe and Euro-America. Any further questions at this stage? I was at the, uh, the Harvard Museums last year and I was very impressed by a section you didn't mention because it's later. It's this wonderful collection of glass imitations of, uh, yes. of uh, plants. plants yes. Um, yes. And I wonder if this is perhaps a um, product of the same tradition of the um, yeah, so a mixture of two idealistic view of uh, nature, nature and this, um, <coughs> has this uh, search for a total view because it's a great variety of, of uh, nature. Is, is yes, these are, these are, this is a collection of glass models uh, of plants. Uh, Men, most of them actual size, so they look, they look real. And these were made, they're not American, they're actually European. They were made by a father and son team uh, named Leopold and, I'm forgetting the other one's name, Georg Blaschka. They were bohemian glassmakers, and they started with, uh, with glass models of uh, marine invertebrates, and then they moved on to plants. And uh, a donor at Harvard was prevailed on by uh, the, the professor of botany to uh, fund a long-term acquisition of these glass models, which could be used in teaching. Uh, those of you who have seen, seen this, this collection will, will remember that some of them are very, very lifelike, and others are, blown, are, are enlarged and cross-sections. So you can, you can use, they could be used in teaching uh, when the, the plant itself is, uh, has died and desiccated and no longer looks as it does when it's alive. These look as though they're alive. So used in conjunction with the materials in the University of Barrio, you have the models that give the, the, the appearance of verisimilitude and the actual specimens that, of course, are desiccated and, and no longer uh, give the, the sense of the life of these things. So um, this is, this is uh, I don't know who their other customers were, who the Blaschka's customers in Europe were, for instance. I know that there are marine invertebrate models in Philadelphia, uh, and I imagine that they, that they were working for, for clients other than Harvard College. Uh, but all of these extremely fragile things were transported from uh, what's now the Czech Republic to Cambridge, Massachusetts. So this is, this is a, you know, it's, a, it's a, again a part of a European and American connection. 
on that note, can we thank you once again for the lovely lecture? Thank you.